they'll do this something like, yeah, sure, you can go online and find everything for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the exact opposite of a Harvard reference. <laughs> yeah. You've now just set the reference pricing at free. Yeah. yeah it's really, yeah. Hard. you know, 5000 yeah, sounds pretty expensive versus free. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because they're thinking, oh, well, I could say $5,000. I might just take that. Uh, thank you for yeah. the, the option. That's funny. This is Superfast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. There's plenty more episodes coming today. We're covering all the mistakes that presenters make when they're putting a presentation across, and I've invited back a real expert on this topic. Dan Dobos from Lead Machine. Welcome back. Thank you, mate. Great to chat again. Now, you've been back several times. Uh, it appears that the discussions we've had in the past have been really well received. We talked about selling. We've talked about uh, productivity. Yeah. Today, we're talking about mistakes. I think this is one of your passion topics, isn't it? Mistakes or presenting? Mistakes. <laughs> I think if there's, if there's one... You know, from a branding perspective, when I think of you, I think of your very raw critical analysis, which is why I have you on my feedback radar. When I want to know how something's going or where we're at, I just say, Dan, just lay it down for me. Give me the honest truth. <laughs> and you pull no punches. You're just like straight into it. I think the good thing about mistakes is that it's that idea that people seem to respond more to things they need to avoid as opposed to pleasure that they can derive. So it seems like we respond more to avoiding pain than deriving. Well, it's like that news saying, if it bleeds, it leads. People are drawn to drama and, and chaos and, and uh, you use mistakes as one of your key points in the framework for when you're actually structuring presentations and maybe we should talk about that. But I, I thought what a good framework might be for this discussion is how about if you think about all of the presentations you've seen, and I think about uh, the presentations I've seen. And when we say presentation, I'll just define that. It, it could be a, a webinar. It could be a, a sales video of slides. It could be a live presentation. And I, I sort of had that in mind when I was thinking about this because I've seen lots of those. But it's when you're being presented something with the idea that you're supposed to be moved to a certain outcome. What things have you considered as mistakes? So if you make a list of things that you would consider would be mistakes, and I've made a list of things, maybe we can just share mistake each, take turns on this, and see if we can come up with a few insights as to how you might go about recognizing these mistakes when you see them. And if you're doing them as a presenter, Perhaps you can try our suggested solutions and see what that does in terms of your results. How about that? Sounds good. All right. So I'm going to let you start with a mistake. I'll let you have the upper hand here, Dan. <laughs> You're a very generous man. Okay. I think the bi- I think one big mistake, I won't say the biggest, but it's, it's up there, is that people don't actually have anything to say. They get on stage and they've done a bit of reading or a bit of research, which isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's original research, but a lot of presentations are just regurgitations of existing material. And it's kind of why every university lecture, well, not every university lecture, but a lot of university lectures, they just have that sort of crappy feel because they're not really talking about experience. I think the best presentations come when someone can share an experience where they've been on a journey and through that journey, they've learned some lessons. So it's not theory, it's real stuff. Maybe that's what makes these sort of podcasts so inspiring and educational is that we're talking about our own real life experiences in the trenches and certainly has been one of the success factors of the podcast that I do that is purely case studies. I think people really resonate with true stories. Definitely. And look, I'd be the first to confess, when I started presenting, that's exactly what I did. It's because everyone does it that way. Yeah. There's whole schools on that. Yeah. There's whole schools that say, you know, just just uh, package up this stuff. And their whole training is homogenized 
uh, rewrites of other people's stuff. In fact, there's gurus whose entire business is founded on just taking what's out there and repackaging it with new yeah. phrases. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> it's, I know. it's amazing. It's, it's hilarious, yeah. And it's a bit sad, really, if that's, if that's all you've got. Really? But just on that, one thing you did mention is that people should share a story of you know the triumph and the the journey. The, I mean, that sounds like the hero's journey framework, which is certainly not original. You're not saying that we have to have an original structure to the content, but that the content should be original. Absolutely, I think structure. You want to use a proven process. I don't think you want to innovate too much there, though. It's always good to innovate. But I think that the whole point is you want to be talking from experience. You want to have something that's different and unique that you're bringing to the table. If you're just summarizing other people's stuff, well, what's the point? And really very much related to this whole point is I think the reason why people do it and certainly why I did it when I first started is I was really scared. I thought, who's going to listen to me? I've got to use all these statistics. I've got to justify everything. And unfortunately, that's something we've very much been brainwashed at school to do, is to not have an opinion, to you know follow the rules, to not make too much noise. And unfortunately, if you're doing that as a presenting strategy, that's a big fail. Oh, they've uh, you know they they do strange things at school, and um, I haven't had the same experience as you because you're actually in the education market for school kids. So I know you're highly qualified on this. I'm only talking as a parent. I've had arguments with teachers about things that they do. For example, they criticised my daughter for taking a presentation that she did and then using the same topic for a a written submission. So that they actually penalized her for repurposing, whereas in the real world, that's considered (laughs) something very clever. And they do seem to have a high level of emphasis on research. It's always research. You could go and look up this stuff and then document it back without copying word for word from Wikipedia. seems to be a recurring theme at school. Yeah, and, and the problem with that is like there's nothing wrong with research. It's good to understand what's out there. It's good to learn and that's that's a positive thing. But the negative thing is when you don't add anything to it, when you lose your voice. And if you lose your voice, well, it's it's really hard to really justify any form of presentation. Well, I think sometimes putting something real or original is so unexpected that people can't even comprehend it. Mm. I remember uh, another situation where my daughter handed in a project and the project was she had to write a book, you know, like come up with a story. And she she handed in her project and the teacher said, oh, honey, no, sorry, look, you have to do your own work. You can't just hand in someone else's. And she goes, oh, this is mine. She goes, no, that this is a book. You can't hand in someone else's book as the story you have to put in your story she said, no that's my story i've written and illustrated it and produced this book yeah and she had one of the online print on demand houses actually print her book yeah awesome and gave it to the teacher and, and it just blew them away and they were yeah. talking about it years later when i go to a, a parent teacher night uh they'd say oh I, I saw your son's book i'm like what book what son's book and they're going Jordan I went no that's my daughter <laughs> it's one of those unisex names yeah. but the teachers had passed it around the common room and it was yeah. it was so out of out of the sphere of what they expect yeah. so that's the impact you can have when you come up with something original and you and you pour all of your energy into it yeah and i think i think the problem is that a lot of the time we're just a bit scared to have an opinion and you know, we're, we're sort of, oh, well, what if, what if someone disagrees with me? Or what if, what if I'm wrong? Well, you know, if you're wrong, that's good too. Well, you'd be sunk, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, like, like you are going to be wrong. There are going to, you're going to do presentations. And if people disagree with you, that's, that's yeah. good. Cause then, then there's, there's some learning from there. So I, I think half the journey is just, is just summoning the courage to say, look, you know what? I'm actually going to think about this for a second and I'm going to have an opinion. Well, I think if you go to the core sort of idea of a presentation, my understanding is that it's simply the, the purpose is to move someone from where they are at the beginning when you start the presentation to where they are at the end. And quite often to move someone, you're going to have to create some conflict or some tension to, to create some emotion or to make them think about things. You don't, you don't want to make them think too much, like paralyze them. And, and I'll launch into one mistake here. This mistake is where people... Uh, especially rookie presenters are packing way too much information into a presentation. Mm. And the, the idea is that 
if you were to try and you know put across you know one or two major points and have someone agree with you on that as a presentation in this case they might put in 50 things and you just paralyze the audience they don't really know what to make of it and then if you combine that with a sort of subsidiary mistake to this which is when the rookie presenter gets up and says i don't have a lot of time so i'm just going to go really fast the audience does a collective groan like mm. oh yeah seriously yeah it's like get organized you know well <laughs> Yeah, you're about to get yeah. unloaded yeah. on with this barrage yeah, yeah, of like, yeah. Brrr, yeah. Brrr, and and you got no chance. Yeah, I would suggest that the best presentations have just one idea, one overriding thing. I'm not saying saying they only have one point, but if you boil the presentation down, it has an essence, it has a soul, and I think that that's important. Well, that's what we're doing here. Is when we had our uh, little discussion about what to talk about, we thought. Of all the things we could talk about, wouldn't it be good just to talk about all the things that people are doing wrong? We've got one core idea, and that is the mistakes that are just killing people's ability to present well. If we could just hmm. cover those and someone was to say, yeah, hmm. I'm, I'm not doing this, 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 or this, okay, they're probably going to do quite well with a presentation without us talking about hmm. or focusing on you know, all the seven steps to do a perfect presentation correctly from the beginning, we're just knocking out the huge holes in the bucket. Mm. Mm. For sure. All right, hit me with a mistake. Next mistake is very much related to slides and there's probably about seven mistakes I'm sure we could discuss here. But the, the mistake that I would like to raise, which is a slightly subtle one, is that I see this all the time. And I, I just wish people understood this, but it seems like even really smart people they just don't get this idea, which is that you've got slide, you've got text on your slides, and obviously you don't have too much text, which is a separate mistake. But let's just say you don't even have that much text. Like if you've got a bit of text, but not that much, so it's not terrible slide. But what people do is they show all the slide, they show all the text, and it takes someone. Maybe even if it's only five or ten seconds to to process that slide, and instead of saying and actually going through the slide with the person, they'll actually say something totally different. So what happens is that the audience is looking at the slide and they're reading the slide, and the presenter is saying something totally not totally different, but building on the slide. So they're not saying the same thing as the slide. So they're trying to read the presenter speaking, and it's it's just everyone's doing different things. There's no synchronization. And this is usually caused because the speaker is not prepared or professional enough to be able to present without the word on the slide. Therefore, it's a crutch. It's really they've turned it into exactly. karaoke. Exactly. <laughs> they've got. They need to be able to see the slide to know what to talk about. It's like very closely related to the one where the presenter's facing the screen for the entire show. Yeah. And not the audience because they don't know their stuff. Mm. But even karaoke is is not as bad as this. Because even if you read the thing, at least the, at least you have that synchronization. Right. So it's even worse than that. You're talking about yeah. a complete disconnect. Yeah. So they're talking. I was actually just at a presentation last night. I was actually a good presenter. I was a great person. I almost wanted to just, you know, at the end she left quickly. I would have told her. But the point is that they, people just don't realize that you've got to, you've, like this is a symphony. You know, we've got you and the audience, they need to be on the same page and and so the whole point is you, you want to show them the slide, but even before you show them the slide, you actually want to be talking the point. So the whole point is that you're in charge. You're the person. They're focusing on you. You're not reading the slide. So that's, that's, actually, that's actually a separate mistake, really. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the technique of talking about the slide and then revealing it. Exactly. So the whole point is that you're that that it's you that they're focusing on, not the slides, and that develops. Off. And you and I have spoken about this yeah. before. I, you gave me some feedback many years ago on this, and I've quite often delivered entire presentations without a single word. Yep. On the slides. Yep. Just awesome. pictures, and that is because you can't misinterpret yep. the word; it's not there. They're forced to look at me and hear what I've got to say about it. Because they'll get images and, and ideas from the picture, but my words will support that mm. and enhance it. Mm. You, you know, a funny story sort of related to this was I once had a seminar which was 
uh, it was a one hour introductory seminar. And it was very unfortunate that we had this terrible traffic jam in Melbourne. And as a result, both myself and everyone that was actually helping in the seminar, there was, you know, two or three other people and we were all, all late. So imagine a room with 80 people in it and no staff. <laughs> so no projector, no screen, just people sitting in the room thinking, what in the world is happening, you absolute losers? So we managed to send them a text message. We said, there's been a traffic jam. Please drive safely. We will start shortly. And anyway, so we got there. It was horribly embarrassing. And I did the presentation at the start. I was there before the helper, uh, helpers, I should say, unfortunately. They, they were all late. And... Um, and I just had to start, obviously. There were people, everyone was there waiting. So I, I knew the presentation, fortunately, off by heart. And so I just went. And then the person came in with the projector. And eventually, we, we, we had half of it with the projector and half of it without. And the, the, the funny thing about this presentation was I got one of the highest conversion rates ever from from that presentation and and I was thinking afterwards why was it like we were total losers at the start by arriving late but you know, maybe they felt sorry for us that might might have been one thing but the other thing that I really got from that was that there was no slides at all so what it did is it was all about me and it really sort of meant that you know the credibility and the character of the presenter was a lot lot more enhanced than when you have the slides and you sort of got, you know, the person's looking at the slides, they're looking at the presenter and, you know, there, there's, that, there's that mix of things. And as a result of that, one of the things that, that I've actually started to do is that whenever I have a slide, I'll actually try to show it for the minimum time possible and I'll, I'll try and black it out. So I'll show them the slide for exactly the point that I want them to see it after I've made the, so I made the point, I show the slide that reinforces, then I black it out. So they go straight back to me. So having that focus on you really, I believe, does have a big impact. Fantastic. Now, I've got a few things just to cover off on that. Just on this topic, while we're here and it's low-hanging fruit, let's just say, look, if you're, if you're whacking up 10 lines of bullet points, you're way off track. <laughs> yeah. It, it forces yep. someone. The first thing an audience member does, they switch away from you, they go look down to their piece of paper and they start writing like a maniac yep. trying to keep up. There's no chance that they're processing what you're saying and you've now made it the bullets and the content on the slide, uh, the focal point, and almost the, the poor cousin to this one is when, when you say, oh, there's a lot of notes here. Don't worry about writing it down so much. I'll give you the handout of this presentation afterwards. And now mm. it's like, okay, you've just given the audience permission to completely switch off altogether. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that doesn't really help people learn or get no. progress. So uh, the other thing that I, you know, a little pet hate that I have is the aspect ratio of the slides. I know it sounds trivial. But the old four by three slides just don't rock my world anymore. I like a sixteen by nine aspect, and that's it's just in keeping with modern screens and and modern media, and and uh, that's sort of the, the sort of more rectangular style of slides. I think it's just for visually more acceptable. Do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I agree. I prefer yeah. that as well. Okay. And look, the, the other thing I think that's relevant to what we've just been discussing is actually something we mentioned in, in another podcast, but I think it's really relevant here is this whole Aristotle view on what makes something persuasive. And he says that there's ethos, pathos, logos. So ethos is your character, pathos is the emotion that you bring out in people, and logos is the logic. So he's, And basically, they've done lots of surveys since then, and they've found that um, the character and who you are accounts for something like 92% of how persuasive something is. The emotion is, is about 7%. The two sometimes get tied together. So, you know, maybe it's, it's more than 7%. There are arguments for that. And, but the logic is, is you know, it's, it's almost no, totally irrelevant. You know, if you can prove that you're credible and say something that's, you know, emotionally engaging, the actual logic of it. And often you, you see people who, you, can, you know, they buy things and they do things which are totally irrational for, for that exact reason. So the points that we're making about slides, the points that we're making about have you know talking from experience, they're very much aligned to you know 
having something that develops your character, you know, showing the slides as little as possible so it's about you, talking from experience, having pictures that develop, you know, that brings out emotion. So it's, it's very much, you know, stuff which, which Aristotle has, has, has made the point of thousands and thousands of years ago. That's fantastic. You know, when I first started my business, when I still had a job, I reinvested the money back into a laptop and my first consulting gig as a moonlighter with my boss's permission, I might add, for $4,000 was to deliver a workshop on mm. sales training, a half-day workshop mm. for financial yeah. planners. And I rocked up with my laptop and yeah. the guy in charge of the projector wasn't in and they couldn't open it. So I delivered my first presentation without the laptop that I'd bought to mm-hmm. deliver it. That was the laptop that I used to start my online business. And luckily... I'd rehearsed and practiced the presentation. I delivered it to a, a test group the week prior and I'd printed off the presenter's notes. So if you are new at this presenting stuff and you haven't delivered the thing many, many times, mm. it's always handy to have a print off of your slides nearby that you could put on a lectern in an absolute emergency mm. so that at least you know what the presentation is even if you've, you've got no ele- electronic aids at all. And... You know, I'm thinking about this as I go to my mastermind event in just two weeks. I'm not getting a laptop or a projector. There's no electronic media. It's all mm. flipboards and speaking mm. directly. Mm. And I know that, as you said, the character and the message is going to be very clear cut because there's zero distractions. Mm. It's mm. pure focus. Mm. And I think I think the other thing that I take from from that story, James, which is something I was going to mention, is a lot of people think that. You know, you just get on stage and, you know, hopefully, you know, you're charismatic and, you know, you can sort of pull it off. And they don't realize the amount of energy and the amount of effort. Um, a, a mentor of mine, when I started to really get into these pre- presenting and these presentations, he, he gave me this metaphor. He says, you know, if you're going to have 100 people in the room, you know, that's 100 hours of time. So 100 hours of time. So let, let's look at that. That's, you know, that's, that's two and a half working weeks. Okay, so you've got 100 hours of time, which you're in charge of. It better be damn good because otherwise you're throwing 100 hours of time down the toilet. And um, it really stuck with me, that idea that, you know, you do have this responsibility. You have these people in front of you. And, you know, when you've got an event, two, three-day events, you know, you work that out. (laughs) Yeah, I've got 170 people for two days. Do the numbers on that. And and 31 for one day. I'm the custodian. Yeah, we'll send that to all the presenters and say, look, this is – this is the responsibility we have. Well, as you know, I do send a brief to presenters and I'm yeah. uh, you know, adamant yeah. about curating the content, uh, controlling yeah. the, sure. the ideas that are presented, receiving the information well in advance to be able to make modifications. I have literally rewritten 30% of the presentations that has ever been put forward to me to present at my own event through mm. being a, a curator of a minimum standard. Mm. because I want someone to come away with a specific outcome mm. and I want them to get value. Yeah, and, and I think that's great. But I, I think really the point here, though, is if you're just starting out with presenting or if you've only done maybe five or ten pres- presentations, I've, I've probably done over a thousand. In fact, I've definitely done over a thousand presentations. And I can say to you that like I've, we've got this event coming up and you know it's, it's a 60-minute it's a so 50 minute presentation, I believe it is. And I, like to me, it's that that's going to be, you know, I'm going to spend, I don't know, three hours, 10 days. I'm probably going to spend 30. Like it's, it's not, it's going to be a lot, a lot of work. Like it's, it, you've got, I think people need to realize that it's not something where you can just wing it and pull it off and hopefully sound good. Sure, once you've developed a presentation and you've done it many, many times, you know, it's the same presentation. You, you, can, you can leverage off that. But um, for most things, if it's a brand new presentation, there's a whole heap of work and there are no shortcuts to, to actually getting to that level. So, so mis- the mistake I think people make there is just thinking that they can do it in, 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 a, in a much shorter period of time than, than is realistic. Yeah, well, th- thank you for handing me that mistake because <laughs> you know the mistake I want to highlight here is not doing the right prep work. And that's, uh, I'm the same. I start building my slide deck after my event 
in preparation for the next year. I copy across my slide deck and I start adding ideas to it during the year as things come up that I think would be very, very important. Mm. And then I'll mm. curate and prepare them. And by the time I get to the event, I know exactly what I want to talk about and I will have run it over through my mind, sitting out in the lineup, out surfing. You have to curate. And, and probably like you, uh, when I'm speaking at different things, a lot. I'll never present the same material twice because I'll do my research mm. and I'll find out who's in the room and I'll find out where they're at and I'll find mm. out what's the relevant context for them. You could go in, in my industry, you could go from complete novice who has no idea what a landing page is to a highly competent technical group who all know what a landing page is and they want to know the, the next level of detail like remarketing code and cookies and how to you know go and fiddle campaigns with them mm. versus when a why should you have a website type audience. Mm. It's, it's critical mm. that you put the effort into being able to meet someone where they're at mm. so that your message has the highest impact. So the two words that come to mind there are context. You've got to be able to fit into to where they're at contextually. Mm and relevance mm. you have to be important to where they're at right now for them to be able to value what you're sharing with them and to be able to move them mm. it's got to be relevant to them and that's why a, a really simple thing to do is to poll the audience mm. if if no one prior to you's done it it's very simple to poll the audience early on your first few minutes to get an understanding of who you're speaking to. If the promoter's not able to pr provide you that information, if you're not sure who you've got, at least poll the audience and then you can tailor, and this is the other thing that preparation allows you to do that you can't do if you're winging it. If you know your material down cold, if you're really truly an expert, you can now tailor your presentation and tune it into the audience. It's like, you've, it's like you've got the guitar and the strings and you're close to the mark, but now you're just fine-tuning it to be pitch perfect for that audience and they're going to hear that lovely melody of a presentation. Mm. No, I think that's exactly right because if you know the presentation so well, what should happen is that you're doing that type of thing. You're asking them about who they are and you're also listening and you're engaging and you know, there are going to be differences and you don't exactly know what's going to happen you know, that's why they call it presenting because you're, you, you're not just running a script. You are also responding. Yeah, and this goes right through to everything. It's, it's even having the right it's, – it's even you presenting things in the right way that makes them respond the most and it could come down to attire even, the way that you dress. Mm. I went to a presentation about one mm. year ago and there's this – you know, fairly popular guy in the internet marketing space and he'd built his whole persona around the surfing culture and then when I saw him present he's all dressed up in a fancy suit and a tie and my, uh, it was such a disconnect I'm thinking who are you doing this for mm. why are you talking about a lifestyle business yeah. and showing us all these videos of you you know in shorts and a t-shirt and now you're in a fancy suit it's like you're Dressing up to trick me. Yeah, you're not going to be wearing a suit at and it, super fast line. I'm not going to be wearing a suit. Just, <laughs> I'll, I'll be well groomed. Yeah. You know, I'll be clean shaven and I'll yeah. have a nice t shirt and jeans yeah. and I will have footwear. Yeah. But I, I think that that's just me being me. And as you said, yeah. character is very important. And I exactly. think the audience needs me to be me. Yeah. to feel comfortable with my message because so they can be them. If I turn up in a tuxedo, they're going to think this it's a James Bond th fancy dress theme maybe, <laughs> uh, which is the yeah. only time I've worn a tie since I left work <laughs> 7 or 8 years ago. Yeah. Because it's yeah. uh, you know, whilst I used to love buying fine clothing, I I'm not into dressing up in a suit. Mm. I'd rather dress in a wetsuit. <laughs> you know, different different situation. Yeah, no for sure. And I think related to this idea of engaging and understanding the audience is if you sort of do, as you say, that little poll, what it does is it says to the audience is that you're, you're actually respectful of them, you're listening to them and they feel sort of understood, okay, this person's going to actually try and give us what we want. So I think that's useful for that reason as well. Very cool. All right. Have you got a mistake you want to counter with? Uh, another mistake is the use of the lectern, which is in some ways, if you, like if you think of all the different distractions, the slides, the lectern, if you're standing behind the lectern, what does that do? You know, it's a barrier. It stops connection. 
So that's something you want to avoid. Yeah, we don't have lecterns at my events. Mm. It does confuse the staging people because most people do have it evidently. Mm. And the other thing that I've noticed, always the staging crew and the video crew, they say to me afterwards, this was a really good event. We've enjoyed doing this one. The information was fascinating. Mm. So I think all that work into setting the staging and by the way, do you know how expensive it is to have freaking curtains and microphones and stage lights and stuff? It's, it's mind-numbingly expensive to have the dressing for the set, but it's all designed to make the highest impact from what's on that platform, to turn, literally turn the spotlight onto that talent for the highest impact with, without the distractions of weird stuff in the background. You know, those big black velt, felt curtains block out distractions the good lighting you know increases the intensity of the presenter and the you know having those the rises so the person's you know easily visible these things are little fine touches that tune up and and color in a fantastic presentation Mm. yeah definitely okay so uh let's talk about another one i think a speaker or a presenter who's too clever is, I find, very annoying. Mm-hmm. What do you and, mean by that? I thought you might say that. <laughs> what I mean by that is it's very common for a presenter to ask the audience questions that are very clever questions yeah. that require a specific answer Yeah. and they don't get the answer they want from the audience because the audience doesn't know the answer and if they do, they're shy to say it in case it's wrong. And then if someone says the wrong answer, the presenter very, uh, you know, very authoritatively says, nope, try again or yeah. wrong answer. And they do this because they want to show how clever they are mm. and how you need them because they're so clever. But mm. what it does, and this is why it's a mistake, mm. it drives a wedge between the person and the audience and it says, yeah. You know, you're not as smart as me, so probably all the things I'm telling you are going to be wasted on you because you're so dumb. Yeah. And it doesn't build rapport or bonding. You don't even like the person. And liking is actually one aspect of selling that can work in your favor. So what I got taught by a very smart speaking expert was tell them the answer and then ask them the question because then – they can show you how clever they are and they can feel smart and now they like you as well because, hey, they're enjoying this game. It's an easy game. It's fun and they're responding and, and you're able to check in that they're on the same page. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Two points come to mind. The mm-hmm. first one is that, yeah, I'd never understood those people. It's as if they <laughs> feel insecure and they have to, you know, sort of try and make themselves feel a bit better and it kills connection and really – What's so much more effective is to actually talk instead of about how good you are, about your mistakes, you know, about how I did this and I failed and this is what I learned and that's what gets the audience to go, wow, there's, there's someone who's been through, you know, a process, a journey, there's an experience, there's, there's something he's learned and instead of me having to make that mistake, I've learned it vicariously through his or her experience. So it's the exact opposite. Yeah, well, I would I would rather experience mistakes that someone else has made and they just tell me the answer rather than have yeah. to do it. Exactly. Then say how look how dumb you are. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 horrible. Now the other thing though that's interesting though, that's a, it's a slightly a slightly slightly a different angle on this where you talk about being clever. Now I, I actually have one tool which I think is very underused which is different to being clever. And it's, very, it's a very important distinction because it may get confused, which is this concept of mystery. And I think that if you can add some mystery into your presentation, uh, that can be very useful. And I'll give you some examples. So, for example, in one presentation, I talk about different principles. So, for example, um, with memory, I talk about how there are five principles – uh, and in that, what I'll do is I'll go through each of those principles and then at the end of it, I'll say, and guess what? They also – the mistake I made when I did this, the first the first word was visualization. Then it was association. So for the visualization, I put a big V and for association, I put a big A and I was gradually building up the word value. 
And but it was so obvious because you got to V A L U. Obviously, the next one was going to be E. So I sort of ruined the surprise. So what someone thankfully told me was they said, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. Just just go through the principles, visualization, association, location, unusual, emotion, and then at the end, reveal the word value. And so let the audience enjoy the pleasure of that surprise. And of them them actually feeling like they've almost discovered something and yeah. pretty much worked it out for themselves. Yeah, some people do work it out, even not many. But they, they, they enjoy, oh, yeah, there's a word. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, And I think yeah. just, just by way of illustration here, uh, what I was talking about with, with Clever, and I should give an example, is if the difference between you getting up and saying, so how many different aspects to memory are there? Who's got an answer? Come on, call it out. You know, someone goes, three, no, seven, no, five, yes. Right, that's where you're making them cold guess something they have no chance to answer versus saying there are five memory techniques, okay, we're going to write them down. Who can remember how many techniques there are? And then they'll shout out five and you say, well done. Yeah. And it's ironic that we're talking about memory because that's what they're just demonstrating, that they, <laughs> they could remember that for the last like three seconds, but it makes them feel like they're participating. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's that's another point. Participation, actually involving them as opposed to your example where you're separating yourself from the audience. I think. Oh, and some people can go an entire presentation without engaging the audience once. Mm. Yeah. They have this monotonal often just dump, just brrr out for the whole presentation without checking in with the audience. I call it checking in. But you need to check in often. Mm. And that would be uh, using mm. devices such as questions and also to have mm. a form of acknowledgement. And while we're on that, this is a related thing. A lot of people do the acknowledgement technique of um, who here or by a show of hands. And mm. I think that's a mistake. Really? Yes. I'm interested. Tell me why. Well, it's impossible to answer that question. You think about it. You're sitting in the audience and you don't know the guy three rows down or four rows back. So you can't really, it's not really a question you can answer. But you can answer the question, put your hand up if you like the color black. Okay. You know. So just being more direct. It's using the word you. It's being, yeah. it, it's the trick. When you're in front of an audience, it looks like there's a lot of people. So you start yeah. talking in plurals. Yes. It, but it's the same rules as an as, uh, email message. When I send an email broadcast to 27,000 people, I won't send an email saying, oh, a number of readers have asked me to send this resource. I'm not going to do that. Cause that and now I've just given the game away that there's not more than one person. Mm. I'm going to use the word you. Mm. Yes. I've attached a video to this, a uh, link to a video that I made for you. Mm. I mean, that's more personal. Yes. It's specific. It's relevant. It's got context because now I'm communicating. And that's why when I've learned this technique and started presenting uh, and using the word you and talking singularly, yes. people would come up to me after my presentation and say, uh, it's amazing. It's like remarkable. It's like you read my mind. This mm. is like you're speaking to me. And I've, I was speaking to them, yeah. <laughs> literally talking to that person yes. but on a leveraged basis. Yeah, I think people just forget that at the end of the day, every communication is one-on-one. -on -one. You're always talking to a person. You're never talking to, you know, a group is not really anything you ever talk to. And it, well, you just you disconnect the more yeah. the more group talk you do. Definitely, it's, and it, you see it. You see it all the time. Like everyone sends emails like this. People present like that, and it's such a mistake. And it's probably probably one of the most fundamental things that will increase. Connection, mm. which helps conversions a lot, and it definitely bolsters character. Mm. Speaking of connection and asking questions, something interesting that I've discovered, which was quite counterintuitive, is that this concept of interaction and how it can be a double-edged sword. So interaction, I think, is great if you're doing a presentation that is purely about transmitting value and the only thing you want people to do is to enjoy the presentation and it definitely adds more joy to people's lives because they think, oh, I know the answer. 
you know, so there is that interaction and that's good. What I found though is that in a sales type situation, interaction, you need a little bit because you don't want it to be totally, you know, just too dark, but too much interaction in a sales situation can actually actually kill sales. And the reason for that is because when you do interaction, everyone says, well, yes, I know the answer. I know the answer. I know the answer. Well, if I know all the answers, what problem are you really solving? So it's, it's, it's been interesting. Well, when I'm talking about engagement, I'm talking about techniques like, does that make sense? I'll put, you, put your hand up if you're sure. with me so far. Well, how's the... Uh, how's the pace? Are we on track? Yeah. So these are easy ones for someone because in their brain, they have to answer that. Oh, yes. <laughs> They're thinking about yeah. it. They have to respond. When you ask a question, you're creating the requirement on behalf of the other person to respond, which means they're checking in. Mm. Now, yes. what you just said reminds me of another mistake. And mm. this is that everything you do must support the sale. And so often I see a presentation where they're, putting something in there because they want to put it in there, but it doesn't support the sale. Mm. If you're in a sales type presentation, I think we need to make it clear that there's, you know, there's different types of presentations. Yeah. Oh, I think everything must support the sale, even if it's not a selling presentation. If you're doing a presentation for education, yeah. if you were trying to onboard users and have them perform a specific behavior yeah. of you know, getting maximum success with their software they've just purchased, for example, sure. then everything you send them should be consistent with that. And so often people send a message or use examples that take people way off the track. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. If you, This is a pretty sneaky one, but let's say you're selling something that costs Five thousand dollars, mm-hmm. which is you know pretty common from the platform. If you put examples all the way through your presentation of low cost items like two dollars, ten dollars, thirty dollars, you're creating all yeah. these reference points for very low amounts. Mm. Now, when you go for the five thousand dollar sale, it seems by a huge amount by contrast. Yes. So you use fifty thousand and a hundred thousand. Exactly. Yeah. You might say. Look, if you want to go to Harvard, your education will cost uh, three hundred and twenty-eight thousand yep. dollars, and it's going to take you s- six years. Yeah. And then if you know, so these are using high reference points. This now supports the sale because you're setting yourself up mm. for a win. Mm. And uh, you know, if you and I've, I've seen where people will use low reference points, like they'll do this something like, yeah, sure, you can go online and find everything for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the exact opposite of a Harvard reference. <laughs> yeah. You've now just set the reference pricing at free. Yeah. yeah it's really yeah. hard. You know, 5000 yeah, sounds pretty expensive versus free. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because they're thinking, oh, well, I could say $5,000. I might just take that. Uh, thank you for yeah. the, the option. That's funny. So one action point on this would be to go through your presentation and see if there's anything that you say in your presentation that goes against or away from the purpose of this presentation. Whatever you're trying to sell, even if it's the idea that someone should take a specific action or that they might just like you, whatever the presentation is, if it's a trust builder or whatever, don't do something that takes away from. And, and like someone might be saying that, uh, that they're fantastic, they support charities, they go to... They go and rebuild villages in Haiti. They da 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 da, and then they'll put a picture of their mm. Lamborghini in the same presentation, mm. and it's incongruous because it's not really supporting the sale. Now, mm. now, mm. now, I'm confused. It's two different ideas. Is he a you know charitable martyr or is he a yeah. capitalist entrepreneur? It's hard to 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 join them up sometimes. Mm. The the other thought that came to mind when when you were mentioning these things is that one way that one of the reasons I think a lot of people feel that they don't have the authority to actually make a point is because they they just feel that look who am I and what one one way that you can really amplify your credibility is just if you if you can reference just as you were mentioning about referencing high prices in Harvard and then you show a low price. Similarly, if you can reference you know, various people that have been successful and link your ideas to these you know, famous people like Warren Buffett and, and all, all sorts of people like that, it then automatically, even though you're not saying quite the same thing, it automatically lends credibility to what you're saying. Yes, the trust is transferred and the, the, yeah. um, you've raised – that's why – you know, people appear really smart when they quote 
famous people. Yeah, but you got to be careful though. You don't you don't want to be too you know, like like you can push this too far and then you just end up summarising people. Well, you push it way too far, you start getting a cease and desist letter from Richard Branson's lawyer saying, yeah. "Could you please take that picture of you and Richard Branson down for when you paid forty five thousand dollars to visit his island, and just not refer to him as your best friend, Richard?" <laughs> uh, you know, and and some marketers have received that letter, <laughs> really, which I think is hilarious <laughs> because they're overusing that that thing. Yeah. I would have thought that everyone by now knows that that's how the whole Necker Island thing works, but evidently not. People go nuts for these posts. Yeah. Picture yeah. with Ra- Richard is uh, it's instant success. Yeah. I think the way it works best if you can spin off the idea. So you can say, here's, here's yes. how this has worked for Warren Buffett. Here's how he prioritizes his day. So when you're prioritizing the way you do your marketing activities, how can we apply this principle? Yeah, that's good. That's like a it's like a variation of the I U, and that's that's a he you, <laughs> and the I U is where you say I like to hmm. make sure that I have a solid routine. When you go about your daily routine, make sure you use a scheduling tool. So switch from I to you, but you're using the he you, which is another great way to segue from a famous person into a specific action that's related to it. Yeah. Like I think, I think it's just a new application. Like, at the end of the day, there are lots of really great ideas and time-tested principles, but a lot of the time, these time-tested principles haven't been applied in interesting ways. So that can be a really good way of presenting something when someone goes, "Oh yeah, I know that point, but oh, I never really thought it applied here." Oh, that can be that's good. So you so you can get a lot a lot of leverage in that way. Well, one little mistake that I see people make is they overuse quotes that are not only used too often, but also aren't actually based on fact. <laughs> yeah. Like the uh, the one about the that some Harvard study about goal setting. Yeah. And the other the other chestnut is the Henry Ford quote about if I'd asked, you know, about transport needs, people said they would have wanted a faster horse. Like yeah. no one in the Ford family can validate that that ever happened. <laughs> it keeps getting yeah. re-perpetuated. Yeah, and sometimes they use a quote like that in a totally wrong context. Even if someone did say it, it still doesn't apply to the point that you're making. So, yeah. So I think um, we're going to round up in a second. I've got one more that I think is important to to mention, and uh, and I'll see if you've got anything else as well. But this one is about this mistake is not leveraging the presentation properly, and I'm talking about either before the presentation during the presentation or after the presentation. A couple of examples on this. I know in the before presentation, you send people an incomplete set of material that they can DVD. fulfill yeah. by turning up to the presentation. Yeah. So that's a before presentation optimization. Yes. During a presentation would be uh, any sort of supportive material or conducive environment to maximizing conversions, so, i.e. as simply as placing a sales desk between where someone's sitting and the exit. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple leverage of the the room. And a after example would be running a post-event seminar online, for example, to summarize the key points from the entire event that they could come and just leverage their learning that next step. I found when I ran post-presentation webinars, Mm. it, it was really easy to make sales because you'd you're doing someone a, a favor. You could frame it like this: say, "Thanks for coming to the event. It was a, a wonderful few days. I actually took quite a few notes myself. And uh, what I've decided to do is put my summary notes into a neat little presentation, and I'd love to share that with you live and actually field your questions so that you can get the maximum value from this event. So I've set up a an online training." If you'd like to go here and confirm your attendance, mm. I'll see you on the, the call. Mm. Something like that. Mm. And then you can go through and you can actually resell each of the presenter's packages. If you are selling things, you can reiterate the main point mm. or action step. Mm. It could be retention mm. in a, a subscription membership. Obviously, I take the recordings from my event, put them into Superfast Business uh, Membership where they are, the, the recordings from all my previous events pretty much are inside there for members' benefit and they can leverage their learning by consuming that content after the event with transcriptions, with audio and 
asking questions of not only me but other people who attended the event. How are they applying it? What results are they getting? Mm. And this really increases their results. It's a way that I can leverage an annual event into a recurring subscription mm. and it just works. And a lot of people will just do their presentation and that's it. Mm. Oh, and one little side note on that. When I present at someone else's event, I will usually run ScreenFlow on my computer or record the audio with a lav mic and my iPhone and I'll give that recording to my team. If it's the video, I can actually give it to my private mastermind members because it's my content mm -hmm. or if it's the audio then i can have them transcribe it and i can turn that into uh, blog posts infographics or bullet points for my members so i'm always repurposing any piece of content that i do mm. like your daughter like my daughter who got penalized by her teacher but in the <laughs> real world turns out it's very very clever yeah what you made me think of as well is this concept that in every presentation and in every process related to a presentation, there are some moments that are much more important than others. So we know that there is something called the primacy and recency effect, which is really just a, um, a memory concept, which says that if you memorize information, if someone gives you 10 pieces of information to remember, you'll remember the first one and the last one a lot easier than everything in the middle. So when you're giving a presentation, it's, it's critical to be aware of that, that people are going to remember the start and people are going to remember the end. So you'd better be pretty good at those parts. How are you going to start? How are you going to end? They're going to matter a lot more than something halfway through. When I learned about the primacy recency, it was very handy as a parent yeah. and when I was selling motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. I put a lot of emphasis on how I ended conversations. Mm. And people do that terribly on the phone uh, when they say they'd leave a message and they'd say, oh, uh, here's my that, – that, like a voice message. They'll say, oh, uh, yeah, uh, such and such here, here's my number. And then they'd say something confusing and vague at the end as the last thing. Yeah. I would always end on the phone number. Yes. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Or if, you've, if you're phoning someone up, say, hi, calling from Mercedes-Benz of Sydney. My name's James. Yes. And I'd emphasize the name because what would happen if they come in and they forget your name and they'd pick up the next salesperson, Yes. Uh, they'd get the commission. <laughs> nice. So I had to remember my name, if anything else. Yes. And I'd say my name last. This is James. Hello, welcome to uh, Mercedes-Benz of Sydney. My name's James. <laughs> <laughs> See how I used to Such the a, accentuation. Beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. I'd, I'd emphasize it and punctuate it. Beautiful. Boom. You know, yeah. like I'd jam it in there as the, as the brain fodder. Awesome. The way I use this also is I think that this is a mistake a lot of people make is that they, you know, it's, it is very useful near the start to give a bit of qualification. You know, if you're a racing car champion and you're talking about racing cars, would be kind of good for us for you to tell us that at the start rather than at the end. Then we realize, oh, probably should have paid more attention. This guy's a genius. So you definitely want to do some level of, you know, why am I qualified to speak about this? But the mistake that I think people make is they put it all at the start. And what I found is that when you're, particularly when you're selling from, from the stage and you want someone to take an action, you actually want to leave some really good qualification stuff about why you are the person to listen to right before you close because they, they, they're going to go, oh, wow, this is this person. And then you close with it. Similarly, um, you know, if you've got something really strong or powerful, a really good point, put that close to when you close because that's when people are thinking about the sale. Oh, it reminds me of one of the most golden phrases in selling. It was um, right near the end where, you, you know, with traditional selling people would talk about the close and you'd say, all right, Dan, let's just summarize this. We've, we've uh, <laughs> gone through this. We've gone through that. We test yeah. drove this. We printed that. Just before I uh, ask, uh, just before someone orders their new car, I like to ask if they have any questions. So, Dan, what questions do you have? Okay. So it's basically, it's a presupposition that if they ask a question, they're at the point where they're going to buy. Uh, so it's a, it's a really nice little way to f finish out. It's signaling we're at the end here and we're getting closer to the result. Mm, okay, interesting.
Interesting. Uh, the other thing also I'd mention just in terms of ending and starting, two really good questions to ask if you're doing a seminar and you want people to take action from your seminar is, number one, if there's only one thing you could do differently from this session, what would it be? If you were going to leave today and you were only allowed to do one thing, what would that one thing be? And the sort of flip of that question is if there's one thing that you need to stop doing as a result of being here today, what is that one thing that you're going to stop doing? Just that idea. I think we've come back to it in several podcasts of just focusing on one. Oh, I think we've even I think we even did it at my last event on your advice. We, you helped me come up with dedicating the last session to my events as the action-taking session where we actually mm. write things down and, and that's exactly what's going to happen at the next event that I have. I even have an action sheet that will be filled out Mm. on the spot so that an attendee is able to leave that event Mm. and get a result Mm. from it, Mm. which will maximize the value. Beautiful. One last mistake from me because I think – are you wanting to finish up or have we still got more time? No, I think we're going to finish up just because we've covered some big concepts and I don't want to make the mistake of putting too much content (laughs) content in one session. (laughs) (laughs) Let's just do one last one. Okay. Okay. One last one is just such an easy way to generate leads is at the end of a seminar, have a feedback sheet and ask for people's feedback. And then at the bottom of that, because most people are going to write positive feedback, is this idea of commitment and consistency. They've just done something positive. Mm -hmm. What are the names of two people who you think would like to receive this free report, which is related to the seminar, which the person who attends the seminar already gets? It's just a, a beautifully easy way of, of generating more leads. That is beautiful, classic leverage of a positive sentiment. Mm. So, Dan, you're the guy with the fantastic memory. Would you like to recap today's session? <laughs> <laughs> I think we covered 17 mistakes, but don't hold me to that number. <laughs> that's outrageous if that's uh, if that's anywhere close to the number. But, uh, is it? It- We'd have to count. We'll have to count, and we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Give it a shot if you uh, if you if you want. I think th- this is our traditional thing. We've pretty much talked about presentation mistakes today in this episode. What what are the mistakes we've talked about? How can you fix them up? Like what should you be doing instead of these mistakes? And we've given some specific action steps along the way, but maybe we could just do a little roundup. And uh, and, I'm, and I'm quite serious. If you can remember some of them, it would be wonderful. If not, I'll have to refer to my show notes here. Okay, okay. We talked about, from the start, not preparing enough. We talked about thinking that, you know, you can just wing it. We talked about talking from theory, repackaging, instead of actually talking from experience. We talked about slides and how there are about seven mistakes just in slides, my friend. So I definitely think we got close to 17. Uh, We talked about the lectern. We talked about the difference between being clever and having some mystery we talked about connection and engagement we talked about a lot of stuff today mate we did i think we have done the whole listening audience and there's a there's a general group term i should probably rephrase that we've done our listener a huge service if they are doing presentations and making any of these mistakes the action step is to change what you're doing to our suggested action and see if you get a better result agreed Dan, I've really enjoyed this podcast again. I love having you on the show as a a regular co-host. I'm sure we could dig up some other topics for future episodes. And uh, thanks so much for sharing. And I'm looking forward to catching up at our live event. Yeah, definitely. Enjoyed it too. Look forward to seeing you soon. No pressure or anything on your presentation, of course. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you'll give me all the mistakes I made. (laughs) Take care. Good on you, mate. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Okay.